I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse in the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Done it. Done it. Done it. Generals gathered in their masses. Done it. And just like witches at black masses. Done it. Done it. Done it. Done it. Evil minds that plot destruction. Done it. Sorcerer of death construction. Oh Lord, yeah, I'm done it. Bow, 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 bow. What are we talking about today, Daniel? Da, da, da. You know, Daniel, sometimes I sit around and I start thinking about things, and the scale of everything around me sort of I find overwhelming. You ever do this? The scale of like the universe, where I start to question, like, you know, my place in this vast cosmos. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, of course, that's a given. But I, I mean, even just the way that, that things come together in our society day to day. Like, I'll be sitting around and I'll be maybe walking down the street or something and I'll look over and there's like a chain link fence next to me. And at top of the chain link fence, there's a roll of barbed wire. And I like disassociate from my body. And all of a sudden I find myself wondering like how... These lumps of metal, this like mineral resources from somewhere got to be mined, extracted, refined, shipped, like turned into steel, boxed up, shipped somewhere else, uh, found its way into some factory that specializes in making razor wire, assembled into giant rolls, shipped out somewhere, cut up, you know, and then ends up here next to me. And, and like, I see this whole thing play out immediately, like my life flashing before my eyes, but instead of my life. It's like uh, clumps of dirt turning into razor wire. And and I just get overwhelmed. And I start looking around and I realize everything around me is this just like product of endless supply chains, endless logistical things. And then, if that's not enough, I dissociate even further and find myself like expanding past this, not even uh, objects anymore, but so much of the behavior and, and larger cultural and, and uh, political things that we find ourselves surrounded by are just the products of these endless supply chains. I know exactly what you're talking about, David. Sometimes uh, when I eat, let's say a slice of pizza, mm -hmm. and I think to myself, man, this slice of pizza will become like the cells within my body. Crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That kind of stuff. Like we're all in this interconnected chain. Um, and, and it's not just things, it's behavior and stuff. Uh, as a sort of aside, before we get to the main topic, the reason I'm bringing this up uh, some guy at some point decided he was going to make his own toaster and like figure out how to, you know, get every single part of it and see how hard and, and how expensive it will be to actually just like build his own toaster from scratch. So he like mined stuff and refined it and blah, blah, blah. It ended up costing him thousands of dollars and taking like a year or two to actually finish it complete. Did he actually mine the material or did he just order? like? No, he uh, actually went and mined the material. <laughs> And I, I guess to play like really fair, he should have like built the things that he was using to mine it. But whatever, we're not going to get picky. The guy built a toaster from scratch and it was significantly worse than like a $12 toaster that he could have bought at the store. Um, Probably could have cooked a mean slice of pizza, though. Who cooks pizza in a toaster? Do you put pizza in a toaster? That's not how you, you do it? In a toaster? Like the vertical thing that like holds bagels or Pop-Tarts or something? You put pizza in there? Well, not initially. It's only if it's left over and I want to heat it up. You don't eat cold. I mean, some people eat cold pizza, David, but... I eat cold pizza. Doesn't the cheese like melt and drip down into the toaster? Yeah, that's why I buy a new toaster every week. Daniel saving the earth, Forkner. That's the beauty of uh, modern supply chain. You can get a toaster for $12. They're disposable. Toaster's like napkins. Yeah. <laughs> when it gets dirty, you throw it out. It's easy. Uh... Okay, wait, we're, we're getting away off. The point I wanted to make before I got distracted by this toaster story is that these incredible supply chains enable not just the things that we're surrounded by, but so much of the behavior that dominates our life. And we see this no more, I, I think, readily in a way that we normally don't think is connected, but absolutely is and, and really drives this behavior as a whole than in war. 
Well, you know, it's interesting you mention war and supply chains, David, because generals have been talking about the importance of logistics in war itself for a very long time. And it's very often the logistical supply chain that sets one army apart from another or one military from another and can actually be the deciding factor in an engagement. Exactly. War is just a big game of logistics. If we want to like really uh, ignore all the suffering and death and stuff <laughs> that, that comes from it, uh, logistics is, is central to what enables modern combat. And we love logistics on this show. We've done a couple episodes on it already. You should check those out. 36 and 37. But what we wanted to do with this episode was take a look at a very specific type of supply chain. That is the arms supply chain, the manufacture and sale of weapons and the accessories to weapons that enable war and conflict around the world. Or more specifically, mostly the sale, because, I mean, this is such a gigantic topic. I mean, we could spend a whole episode just on the waste that is generated from the accessories of war, all the bombs that are just buried in the ocean, right? There's so much that could be said about that. There's so much that could be said about the inputs to manufacture um, and the type of pollution that is generated from all our military activity. But I think what's really interesting is when you start to look at the international trade of weapons itself, the uh, agreements that are established, the money that is made in this process, and the motive behind all this trade is perhaps not what we are led to believe. That is, that this trade is carried out for the security and economic benefit of a national citizenry like the United States. And in fact, this international trade is enormous. A lot of dollar figures have been put out here and there, but here's one statistic that I think really uh, highlights just how important this international trade of arms plays in our own national economy here in the United States. And that's that of the $2.2 trillion value of our factory output, David, a whole 10% of that goes into the production of weapons. So what you're saying is 10% in terms of value of the entire U.S. manufacturing capability is devoted, maybe we're at war, maybe we're not, but, but, you know, ostensibly peacetime to the creation of weapons of war. That's right. And as we've talked about, these supply chains often involve many different regions around the world. So that doesn't even really get close to showing us the scope of how this plays out around the world. And David, there's a few points that I think we want to convey throughout this episode. And that's that this international trade of arms overall uh, has the effect of funneling the wealth of taxpayers into overpriced and corrupt contracts between taxpayers, governments, and these arms manufacturers. It impoverishes people in the less developed countries where these arms are eventually sold, often unnecessarily and always at the expense of something more meaningful that money could be spent on, like medicine and social infrastructure. It creates instability and insecurity around the world, while also resulting in the massive loss of life for those caught in the inevitable conflict that results from all these weapons that are in circulation. And all of this so that a small group of elite government officials, corporate executives, and independent dealers can make lots and lots of money. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, Daniel, and and we absolutely will get to this later on in the episode. And I really do promise that this time, because I know we say that a lot. But it's not just a matter of a small group of people who are getting wealthy off this uh, sales of arms and, and impoverishing the citizens of the nations that are paying for these arms. But I mean, there's a huge amount of suffering involved in all this, too. And, and we'll, I'll absolutely talk about that. And at the same time, there's like this weird sort of cultural celebration of the vision of an arms dealer. It's sort of a sexy thing. When I say arms dealer, like we get this this image in our head of this like uh, adventurer, like traveling around selling like uh secretive boxes full of like bombs and stuff to i don't know like rhodesia so a bunch of like white nationalists can murder a bunch of people <laughs> or, or whatever and and we make uh cultural things about it there's there's sexy movies about it like uh lord of war which condemns this but also like sort of celebrates it in a fun way war dogs that was a recent movie 
Yeah, War Dogs. Um, there's like even references in old shows, like like I, I remember watching in X Files, where they talk about like Soldiers of Fortune, and it, it's a magazine more targeted at mercenaries. But there's still that that arms sales component of it. It's something that that is sexy and and exciting and has become a mainstay in media, but really it's always focusing on these people who are traveling around selling this stuff and living this luxurious Wolf of Wall Street kind of life with also the danger of mercenary and intrigue and breaking international agreements. It's like it's like a spy finance bro or something. And I don't know when this, this image came up. I don't know why we keep continuing this because these people are really dealers of death and they profit off of death around the world. And, and yeah, I think we know that and we say that, but our actions reflecting them are very different. And I, I want to absolutely condemn everything that is, is happening in this whole field, not only just from these like renegade arms dealers, which we'll talk about, but also the the very like banality of evil, which I keep coming back to in the last few episodes, where there are jobs that you can go and get at Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or Boeing as a uh, salesperson, as a, as a sales manager for a, a line of products, like a radar system or whatever. And you get paid, you know, like a very low but comfortable six-figure salary, 130000 maybe at the max salary, to sell weapons of death around the world. And that, that is your job. And you come home, you work eight hours, you go home, you, you uh, eat dinner with your family, and then you like put some money away in a 401k and your Roth IRA, and then you go back to work the next day. And, and you can live with this like very comfortably, but like you are absolutely spreading death around the world. And uh, for some reason, we don't condemn this. And I, I've never heard anybody say, hey, you know, you're working at Lockheed Martin, you're working at Raytheon, like, what the hell, like, you're, you're a murderer. But uh, again, I'm getting way ahead of myself, so maybe I should stop there. Well, I think there's a reason people don't condemn it, David, and that's because going back to what you're saying about how our culture kind of embraces these ideals is in the public discourse around uh, military weapons, procurement and sale, there's this uh, underlying assumption that even when costs are too high or when things are not done properly, at the end of the day, this industry exists because we depend on it for national security. And that when we're selling weapons across the globe to some country, we're doing so because we are helping someone uphold democracy. We are giving people the resources they need to protect themselves, right? This was a big talking point in the war of Iraq, where the U.S. military was saying we need to assist the Iraqi government in arming their their uh, army so that they can better protect themselves. It's a, it was seen as a very patriotic thing to do. And that's how all this trading gets sold to us as people who ultimately have to pay for it, right? The U.S. military spends some $670 or $80 billion every year on defense. And if you break that down to a per capita figure, that's $2,100. Defense. On what? You can't see, but I'm doing air quotes. Defense. <laughs> right. Well, that's another, I mean, that's another point we could comment on is how all this gets framed in terms of defense when we're building bombs, right? We're delivering yeah. weapons that fire bullets that kill people, right? These are defense contractors, not offense manufacturers. Exactly. And so to justify each of us representing $2,100 of our military spending each year, we have to believe that it goes to a good purpose. And that's kind of what I think the point of this episode is doing is to address that paradigm and really question if the arms deals that are going on around the world even satisfy what the stated purpose of it is. Yeah. And those are all things that we're going to address as we go. And then I think the one area, though, that does get flack in terms of this uh, manufacturing of weapons is those runaway costs that lead to these things like 680 or 690 billion dollars in annual costs for the US military and and then of course even more if you're adding all the other militaries around the world that the US dramatically outspends everyone else and it's not even close but these giant numbers of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars are presented to the public by media outlets saying look how much we're wasting on this stuff we see things like the F35 program which has gotten a lot of flack about its runaway costs we see things a reporting on like, oh, yeah, you know, this toothbrush costs $700 or the military is buying $1,000 hammers or whatever it is. And that is OK for people to uh, criticize. Um, but there's never any question about like, well, should we be buying these things in the first place? It's just like, oh, yeah, these planes are too much. 
But of course we need the planes. Of course we need to buy them. Of course we need to be ready to bomb stuff. We're actively bombing them anyway. Uh, you can't criticize the larger mechanisms of these devices, but you can well, basically complain or try and negotiate or bargain about how expensive they are. And to be fair, they are extremely expensive, and there's a number of reasons why that's the case. Well, let's just start there, Dave. Let's talk a little bit about those overpriced hammers, because this is something that anyone can immediately connect to the fact that they pay taxes every year, right? So Citations needed another podcast that we enjoyed, did a great episode recently on corruption called Western Media's Narrow Colonial Definition of Corruption on the paradoxical way that corruption is portrayed by Western media. And that is that the West and other countries in the global North being incorruptible bastions of democracy and countries in the global South and in Africa particularly being portrayed as highly corrupt. This is a narrative that almost anyone is familiar with. If you think about politics in African nations, you probably conjure this image of corrupt politicians who are swindling money, right? And this fits the narrative, but it's often because of the way that corruption is more explicit in poorer countries that we can justify the fact that our countries are not corrupt and these more developing countries are. As an example, I was in a, a Southeast Asian country a few years ago with a friend, and we were stopped by a local policeman as we were traveling about. And we were basically forced to pay a bribe to this police officer to avoid a hefty ticket. And when you think about that type of corruption, that rarely, if ever, happens in a country like the United States, right? If it did, that officer would likely spend time in jail or at the very least get fired. But that's because the type of corruption that goes on in the Western world is more invisible. And it occurs in a much more sophisticated and systematic way, right? Right. Well, we've talked a little bit about this, not so much with the language of corruption, but we have mentioned in the past that things like uh, theft in the United States, where somebody breaks into your house and steals something or, or steals your car or whatever it is, is much smaller than the amount that employers steal from their employees and wage theft, where they're not directly taking things out of your pocket. They're not reaching in and pulling out you know, your, your wallet and rifling through and grabbing the cash. But they are denying you the money that you're owed, technically, according to the law and your contracts. But that kind of crime rarely, if ever, gets punished. But it's much more pervasive and represents much more than all goods that are stolen in ways that we traditionally think of as crime. And I think this corruption that you're talking about, Daniel, is very similar. You have this overt, you know, pay me $50 or I'm going to lock you up in jail mm -hmm. that you see in some places versus like, hey, you know, I'm going to rig this, this contract so it's in my favor so I make a million dollars and nobody ever hears about it. And in the United States, police departments across the country are allowed to uh, seize assets that they acquire in the process of uh, detaining somebody or in the process of an arrest. And even when someone is found to be not guilty, oftentimes the police simply keep whatever they took from them. And in fact, the overall amount of value that is taken by police through asset forfeiture overshadows all forms of violent burglary in this country. So. In a way, our police actually do participate in this very direct, overt form of theft from citizens. It's just, again, it goes kind of unreported and behind the scenes, so to speak. Well, it's also legal, Daniel. And if it's legal, it can't be morally bad, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> but to bring it back to this topic and those overpriced hammers you mentioned, there was a 1986 article in the Los Angeles Times expressing frustration at what had been clear corruption between Pentagon officials and military manufacturers to cheat the American taxpayer. And I just want to list off a few of the items that the U.S. military purchased uh, that was cited in this 1986 article. And remember that these dollar figures are not adjusted for today's inflation, okay? One of the items cited was a $640 toilet seat that the military purchased. They had a contract to purchase screws, you know, the things you use a screwdriver to just screw into the wall, for $37 each. Uh, Lockheed Martin sold the Pentagon coffee makers for $7,622 each. The military was purchasing ashtrays at a price tag of $659. And one of the more notorious items was a plain round screw nut 
uh, made by McDonnell Douglas. These are the things that you can pick up from the hardware store for about 10 cents each. Those were being sold to the Navy for $2,043 each. What a steal. What a steal. And in the United States, Lockheed Martin is now the largest benefactor of the Pentagon's contracts with arms manufacturers. In 2017, they received $35 billion from the Pentagon, which is more than most U.S. federal agencies and about three quarters the entire budget of the U.S. State Department. And speaking of those F-35s, David, Lockheed Martin also just recently secured the largest arms procurement deal in history. Valued at $34 billion, Lockheed Martin will deliver almost 500 new F-35 jets to the Pentagon. At the lowest unit cost uh, ever for that, that aircraft. And uh, below what their goals were for the price, Daniel, you're, you're selling them short. They're coming in under budget and ahead of schedule. Well, uh, not ahead of schedule, more like years behind schedule. But Well, I guess that's a, a small win for the U.S. taxpayer. Yeah, <laughs> got to take what we can. Right. Not that we ever talk about the fact if we need these planes or not. So these relationships uh, involving arms dealers who overcharge uh, the U.S. taxpayer, charging them $2,000 for a screw nut, the government and military officials who indirectly profit off of these relationships. I think we could consider this a form of corruption, right? Uh, this corruption is paid for directly out of the pockets of citizens just like you, just like me. And it's no different from that bribe that I had to pay that policeman, right? The only difference is it occurs in such a roundabout secret way that we here in America don't even see it. And in fact, I have one more item for you, David. It was revealed last year in 2018 that the U.S. Air Force had purchased at least three toilet seat covers for its C-5 cargo plane at around, what would you guess? What's the most you would pay for a toilet seat cover, David? Are we talking like heated? Uh, does it have a bidet? Like what features? No, this is this is a plastic component. There's no moving parts. There's no electrical components. Is it like bulletproof? I don't think anyone in a C5 cargo plane has to worry about. Is it tactical? Is it a tactical toilet seat? I'll, I'll include some uh, camo spray paint for you. Okay. Uh, what's the most I'd be willing to pay? I don't even know what a toilet seat costs. I can't remember buying one. Well, you can pick up an entire toilet from the hardware store for like two, three hundred bucks. Okay, well, one hundred fifty at the low end. Let's give a little uh, multiplication there for the government procurement process, and I'll say a cool thousand dollars for a toilet seat. Mm. Why don't you multiply that by ten? Ten million dollars. <laughs> No, you 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 multiply too much. It's ten thousand dollars, David. The U.S. Air Force paid ten thousand dollars each for at least three toilet seat covers, and this was such a scandal it prompted a senator to write a stern letter uh, in twenty eighteen. But this is a figure that comes directly out of the pockets of ordinary people. Uh, I got to admit, I cheated here, Daniel, and I did read the article you're talking about, and I knew the price even though I was playing dumb. Dave. But uh, listeners be happy. The military is now 3D printing their toilet seats for the low, low cost of $300 each. Another win for the taxpayer. So that's just one form of corruption, the, the overcharging of things. And of course, there are many more layers to this, not least of which is the revolving door nature of how government officials, weapons dealers, military contractors, lobbyists for the arms industry all kind of go in and out of government positions and back to executive positions at these companies. For example, within the first year of his presidency, George W. Bush had staffed his administration with over 30 arms dealers and consultants from the arms industry. And that didn't end with George Bush, Daniel. In fact, it's still going. In fact, literally today, earlier, just a couple hours before we started recording this episode, Donald Trump announced that the Secretary of Defense, Patrick Shanahan, who had been a senior member of Boeing before he joined the administration as Secretary of Defense, has been replaced by a man named Mark Esper, who before he got this role, he was the uh, head of government relations and procurement for Raytheon. So basically uh, from one defense contractor to another. And these are the people who are basically deciding what contracts get awarded out. These are the Secretary of Defenses of the United States. It's very much a revolving door between 
these companies and the people associated with them and the governmental structures that put out these requests for procurement and eventually award the contracts, thus enriching the people who are stockholders, these very people awarding the contracts. It's, it's a very interesting cycle of money that just goes around and around in circles and makes the people who are uh, lucky enough to be in charge of these things, people like Dick Cheney and his Halliburton ties, very wealthy. I think that wealth lies at the heart at what is the ultimate corruption going on here. You know, overpriced hammers, that's a small fry issue here and really just a symptom of the fact that a larger network of corruption has been allowed to proliferate. And that's that international arms dealers operate by encouraging government to set in motion various arms races so that they ultimately can profit off both the initial buildup of arms and the inevitable response to that buildup as other countries or regions attempt to catch up and close that technological gap, right? The fact that these companies get away with charging $7,000 for a coffee maker is really just a symptom of the infiltration of this process that hijacks our political process, directs our foreign policy, and ultimately creates war for the sake of profit. But to illustrate this process, David, I want to introduce you to a man named Basil Saharov. Have you heard of him? No, but with a name like that, I should have. Yeah, we are about to. So Basil Saharov was one of those people who lived a life more scandalous than probably any fictional portrayal could possibly do justice. Much of his life is shrouded in mystery. He changed his name often. One of his earliest jobs, David, when he lived in Constantinople was as an arsonist for the fire department. Wait, oh. <laughs> wait, go back. I don't know what you're about to say, but he was an arsonist working for the fire department. That's right. He would set fires. No, I said that correctly. His job was to go around town, set fire to buildings like luxury hotels, uh-huh. and then the fire department would show up. They'd you know, demand their payment from the owner to put the fire out, and then Basel would get a cut of that uh, agreement. It's a very like ancient Rome style of, of fire departments. I didn't realize Constantinople had that, I guess, fairly recently. Yeah, uh, the, the legacy of that Roman innovation lived on. Um, I forgot to mention, so this was going on in the late 1800s, right? He was born, uh, I don't remember, 1870, maybe somewhere around there. So he lived a, a scandalous life. He was born in Greece. He moved to Constantinople. He eventually found himself in Cyprus. Then he moved to the United States. Uh, He was always involved in some scandal. He would pose as the nephew of some Russian duke or some wealthy businessman. At one point, he married a rich New York woman, but he was then recognized at a party as being the husband of a rich European woman. So he had to flee that scene. Uh, He worked as a merchant. He brokered young women as factory workers between Ireland and Massachusetts in 1883, except it was a giant scam and there was no factory work. So they ran him out of town there. This was a true con artist, but it was through armament sales in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that he eventually found his niche and became one of the richest men in the world. He worked for an arms dealer, a manufacturing company, and one of his early infamous deals was convincing his home country, Greece, to purchase a defective Nordenfelt submarine, after which he quickly traveled to Constantinople and told them that Greece had purchased this submarine. It was super deadly. They needed to defend themselves. And of course, this was a bitter rival of Greece at the time. So they purchased two submarines. And then he sped off to Russia, where he convinced them that the Ottoman Empire was patrolling the Black Sea with these two submarines and got them to purchase two of them. And then it was only later when one of these countries actually attempted to test one of these submarines by firing a torpedo, which was its main selling point, that it could do that. Uh, That's when their submarine capsized and sank. Ultimately, none of these submarines were ever put into service. But in this process, Zaharoff learned that he could make a lot of money by pitting nations against one another, really playing up to that nationalistic fear and profiting handsomely. By 1911, he sat on the board of directors for Vickers, a major weapons company, and he became wealthy by fueling the tension between countries in the lead up to World War I and supplying all of them with his products. So this guy, Daniel, it sounds to me like he almost had a hand in leading up to all the tensions and like oh, fucked up treaties and arms deals that enabled World War I to happen in the first place. 
And that's in fact what many people after World War I concluded. There was a 1921 League of Nations report that condemned heavily the arms companies that were involved in this lead up as being responsible for, quote, fomenting war scares, bribing government officials, disseminating false reports concerning the military programs of countries, and organizing international armament rings to accentuate the arms race by playing one country off against another, end quote. And so this, this was a major concern internationally, right? Countries came together and they realized, oh, wait, we got played. These arms companies created tensions amongst ourselves so that they could profit. And at the end of the day, though, nothing happened. Uh, in fact, many of these companies were effective at preventing international agreements on disarmament from ever taking place. Well, it's interesting that they condemned anything at all. And I, I think it's worth noting here because that was really uh, the the idea of the war was fresh in everybody's minds. Uh, the war was just so catastrophic and terrifying compared to everything else that happened previous to this. And we've talked about this a little bit on the show before, how the fact that the Great War, which is what they were calling World War One at the time, was just so dramatic and over the top. They really did do a good job putting in treaties saying, you know, like, no, we're going to ban chemical weapon uses and no, we're going to, you know, ensure that that there's rules to war, um, even if, you know, ultimately most of the time they're broken and we have war criminals everywhere running around willy nilly like it's nothing today. But there was at least an attempt to try and, quote unquote, civilize. And it's a disgusting word to use here, but but the the actions and, and these wars against each other. And part of that was the condemnation of these arms dealers. And there were several who were involved in this. Of course, Zaharoff was, I guess, one of the most major of these these men. But today, you know, I was reading earlier this week these articles about everything that's going on with these arms deals today. And uh, it, it's interesting how differently we talk about them now. I mean, at the, this time, they were saying, you know, this is a man who fomented war. And, and that was what his actions as an arms dealer was doing. But earlier this week, for example, I was reading this headline and I was reading into news publications like NPR and Bloomberg saying, oh, yeah, we're going to send two billion dollars worth of arms deals to Taiwan. And of course, at the same time, you know, there's escalating tensions between China and Taiwan, which are fanned in large part by the United States to serve its own imperial purposes, even more so because of things like these arms deals that are happening right now. But it's sold as like, oh, now Taiwan will be able to defend itself. Uh, ignoring the fact that you're adding a huge amount of weapons and tools into this already hotbed action area that ultimately are these these tools will either end up being useless or used to kill people. Those are the only two options. And we don't talk about it like this is a problem. We don't say this is leading to escalated tensions in the area. We say $2 billion worth of arms deals have been secured. These are the companies involved in this. Please buy their stocks. Uh, they're going up. And we, we talk about it as a celebration, an economic victory. And I don't know when this shift happened exactly, but absolutely today, almost every talk that we have about arms deals, um, even ones where there is some pushback, like we'll talk about with Yemen and Saudi Arabia in a little bit, they're, they're seen as little economic victories, as, as pushing things forward for the United States' economic interests. And we've lost sight of this fact that, you know, these people are encouraging war. And all the tragedies and terrors that go along with it. And the fact that journalists and reporters aren't talking about this, that we're saying this in just the very driest, you know, here's what benefits us, is disgusting. Yeah, I think you hit on a number of points there. The way the economy plays into this, but also the way this subtly, or not, not so subtly actually, affects foreign policy. Let's talk about another issue going on right now, which is, you mentioned Yemen and Saudi Arabia, which currently is being described as one of the worst humanitarian crises going on in the world today. And Saudi Arabia has conducted numerous bombings that have killed thousands of innocent people. And in fact, journalist Jamal Khashoggi was murdered by the Saudi government last October for condemning Saudi's role in these terrible killings. Hey, there's, an, there's another arms dealer named Khashoggi. Maybe that's his brother. Maybe it's his father. Yeah, it is. Oh, no, it's his, uh, his uncle. He's, he was a famous arms dealer worth $4 billion. Maybe that's uh, how he knew so much, David. And, and I guess in addition to that uncle factoid right there, I think it's also worth noting that bombs and weapons don't have to be used directly to be causing lasting damage. Um, in this case, the a blockade that Saudi Arabia has set up in order to prevent aid and other resources from entering Yemen have 
uh, cause what you're talking about in this terrible humanitarian crisis. And yeah, there are thousands and thousands of people who have been directly killed by Saudi Arabia, but there are many millions more who are being starved to death or who are actively dying from starvation in Yemen because of this blockade that Saudi Arabia is is running with their military with the full support of the United States and uh, other countries who are providing some of these arms to them. Well, in response to this crisis and the murder of that journalist in particular, Germany implemented a ban on weapon exports to Saudi Arabia, which it has since extended to September 2019. And so what's interesting here, David, is that Germany plays an important role in the supply chain for BAE Systems, which is a British weapons dealer and one of the biggest in the world. And it just so happens that Saudi Arabia is BAE's largest customer. So Germany's decision to stop taking part in arming this government that is actively murdering journalists and causing the death of so many innocent civilians has meant that BAE will have trouble fulfilling promises it made to deliver weapons to Saudi Arabia. So in response, Jeremy Hunt, the UK foreign secretary, called up Germany's foreign minister to implore them not to do that, saying that Germany's decision will hurt several companies in the war machine supply chain, right? And I think we should just stop and think about this for a second. We have here a major democratic government saying, yes, this is a terrible humanitarian crisis. And yes, the murdering of journalists by Saudi Arabia is reprehensible. But if we don't continue to supply them weapons, then the companies that exist for that purpose will lose market value. And in fact, the same month he said this to Germany, a unanimous report by the Select Committee on International Relations Yemen, which is a, a subset of the UK parliament, concluded that UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia violated the law. Quote, we assess that the UK government is narrowly on the wrong side of international humanitarian law. Given the volume and type of arms being exported to the Saudi-led coalition, we believe they are highly likely to be the cause of significant civilian casualties in Yemen, risking the contravention of international humanitarian law. But the drama isn't just in UK and Germany, Daniel. There's a similar one going on here in the US right now. So typically, weapon exports must be approved by Congress, but lately they've been blocking these exports to Saudi Arabia specifically because of the way that they've been ending up used, and that is to kill innocent people. But then in May, President Trump announced that he was going to circumvent Congress by declaring a state of emergency so that this $8 billion worth of weapons contracts could, in fact, be shipped to Saudi Arabia. And this has angered both sides of the House, Republicans and Democrats. And so new legislation is being pushed to prevent this abuse of power right now. And of course, this is just an additional shipment that's going to Saudi Arabia after years and years of some of the largest arms sales in U.S. history that has been going to the despotic state. And I saw this interesting thing when, when doing research about all this stuff and, and just consuming my general news media. For those of you who aren't super aware of what's happening in, in Yemen, it's sort of a proxy war. Saudi Arabia is fighting the rebels in Yemen and the rebels are backed uh, by Iran. And uh, every now and then... Iran will send a missile or something to the rebels. The rebels will fire it. Um, it'll damage something. It'll maybe kill some civilians. And you'll see it reported in the media, Iranian-backed missiles blow up subway station or Iranian-backed missiles blow up mosque, whatever it is that, that is blowing up. It's always an Iranian-backed missile because the Iranians are the ones who manufactured the missile. But anytime a Saudi Arabian plane drops a bomb that blows up a hospital or, or a camp or whatever, it's never in the headlines saying, American-backed bomb kills dozens in hospital detonation. Uh, it's just something that mysteriously happens from this bomb that appeared out of nowhere that Saudi Arabia managed to drop. And, and the media very carefully manages the way that we talk about these things. Uh, if somebody else is doing it that threatens U.S. hegemonic power, of course, they're the ones that are guilty, even if they're doing exactly the same thing the United States is doing, in this case, fighting a proxy war in a country that it has no business doing anything in. And at the same time, supporting these egregious human rights violations, all while saying that, oh, yeah, we're not the aggressors. We're out here fighting for good and democracy. And speaking of American hegemony, another interesting thing happened just a couple of months ago. In April of this year, President Trump set in motion the removal of the United States from the Arms Trade Treaty, which is an international treaty designed to regulate the export of weapons by countries around the world. 
And in particular, it's designed to prevent the sale of weapons that are at risk for being used to facilitate terrorist attacks or otherwise violate human rights or facilitate genocide and crimes against humanity. I think this is what happens, David, when uh, you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, you're putting your uniform on, and you ask yourself, wait, are, are we the bad guys? <laughs> are we the baddies? Yeah, are we the baddies? And then you just say, well, whatever. And what's interesting about this uh, treaty department is that the arms trade treaty was set up to be in America's best interest because it regulates other countries' ability to export weapons. We don't want other countries to export weapons to groups that we as an American country define as terrorists because that could harm our economic interest or, or whatever. But the current administration has decided that it's better to free ourselves up to, uh, so that we're not bound by these rules so that we can export weapons to whomever, whenever we want which in a way kind of goes against what is in our own interest from a uh, national security standpoint. Well, we'll talk about that national security perspective in, in a moment. But I just want to point out here that, of course, the United States is the one creating these treaties, making sure everyone signs them and is abiding by them. And then immediately, once uh, it benefits our own interests, we back out of it. And of course, you know, we could just actually ignore the treaty and operate rogue, uh, and no one would be able to enforce us. But specifically, the, I think the decision that Trump has made to, to pull us directly out of it, to make us no longer a signatory of this thing, is uh, much more insidious because, yeah, these treaties are mostly toothless. What is someone going to do if the United States decides to sell weapons or something? Are they going to sanction us? Are they going to ruin their economy to sanction us? Are they going to attack us? No, they can't do anything. Um, and, and the U.S. knows that when they write these treaties. But the choice not to just ignore it, but to completely remove ourselves from it is really important because it gives not just our ability to ignore all this stuff as, as the U.S. government, but also the corporations that serve these interests, the ability to do so without having their funds overseas threatened or their procurement contracts with all sorts of nations around the world threatened. And that means that we can make sure that money is always flowing into this military industrial complex to further feed these weapons of war, while also at the same time regulating the ability to do so for the rest of the world. We can become a de facto uh, monopoly, sort of, in terms of making sure that we are the only ones on the block providing these guns. So it's, it's sort of like we come in here, we make sure we're selling guns to everybody. We're making sure that if we like you more, you get better guns. You have access to more advanced equipment. So we're going to sell you instead of old F-16s, you can join our F-35 development program and have the latest fifth generation modern aircraft. Uh, you can have access to all this if we let you, but you're going to pay out the nodes for it. And, and those of you who are uh, oppressive governments who are using these weapons to control your own citizens, to kill people who are innocent and have no reason, well, we'll still sell to you. It's just going to be inferior equipment that you can use easily on your own population, but not so much to cause trouble outside of your borders. And then it's sort of at that point becomes very obvious that the U.S. is not just selling these things for defense. Like, what is somebody going to be able to do with a weapon that can't actually defend itself from a modern military that might have interest in your nation? Uh, the only people that you can use it on are those less armed than you. And that is, you know, maybe ostensibly rebels, but also your own civilians. And those frequently are the people who suffer the most at the hands of these weapons when we provide them to these regimes around the world. And I say regimes, but that's a very American way of defining somebody as unwanted or somebody who goes against American policies. But in many times, they're just governments, you know, and, and they use these tools just as much as anybody to oppress their own citizens. Well, this brings up a question in my mind, David, and that's so who are we selling these weapons to and are we discriminating in any way against those who are displaying human rights abuses or otherwise mired in violent conflict? Because this treaty departure suggests that we are more interested in our economic interests than any notion of human rights. But I think that's a pretty big charge to levy against any government, especially one that uh, espouses democratic and moral visions for itself, right? Uh, so I did find a paper specifically on this question that looks at data on arms sales around the world over a historic period to try to tease out, do we sell weapons to countries who abuse them? Or, or do we at least attempt not to do so? So this paper is from 2010. It's titled, The Organized Hypocrisy of Ethical Foreign Policy 
Human Rights, Democracy, and Western Arms Sales. And authors Richard Perkins and Eric Neumayer uh, wanted to know the answer to that question I just mentioned. Quote, A defining feature of geopolitics over the past two decades has been the extent to which Western political leaders have placed ethical and moral considerations at the heart of their foreign policy discourse, which has invariably included a heightened commitment to promote human rights and, to a greater or lesser extent, discursive endorsement for the principle of protecting or advancing democracy in extraterritorial spaces. A central question is whether this scalar construction of state morality, responsibility, and geopolitical interests, laced with utopian visions of a world society built upon universal values, shared rules, and mutual gains, amounts to anything more than empty rhetoric. End quote. And so to help answer this question, the researchers looked at international arms deals to figure out the difference between our government's stated ethical visions and their own self-interested economies. Their measurements have two simple variables. Have the major Western arms exporters, which are US, France, Germany, and the UK, historically, one, halted weapons exports to human rights abuses, or two, decreased the share of their exports to those human rights abusers. And based on the data, they conclude that there has been no systemic discrimination of any sort. Western countries have sold to whoever, regardless of the human rights implications, so long as it satisfied their domestic economy or some conception of their own security. And this occurs, as the authors point out, because those inside exporter countries are competing with themselves to acquire wealth and power for themselves and therefore prioritize domestic concerns over abiding by those toothless international standards like you mentioned, David. Um, Case in point, when Donald Trump announced that he would be withdrawing the U.S. from the International Arms Trade Treaty, he did so at an annual National Rifle Association meeting. And to the cheering crowd, he said, quote, we will never allow foreign bureaucrats to trample on your Second Amendment freedoms. I hope you're happy, end quote. <laughs> Which is telling because that treaty in no way impacts the ability for American citizens to acquire firearms for themselves. Um, but it could impact the revenue for U.S. weapons companies trying to export as quickly as possible to anyone who will buy their product. And in a way, David, this paper perfectly predicts the drama that is Germany's weapons export ban to Saudi Arabia and the U.K.'s response. From the paper, quote, There will likely be exceptions where human rights abuses in potential recipient states are especially acute or where leaders show blatant disregard for democratic principles State rulers may respond to normative obligations regarding humanitarianism and democratic freedoms by enforcing export restrictions. International outrage, increased domestic pressure, and heightened concerns about reputation might push self interest towards actions that protect humanitarian goals. Yet we believe that such instances are likely to be rare. For the most part, governments will seek to meet normative expectations to protect distant strangers through symbolic politics, that is, talking about their values, making public pledges to consider human rights and democratic conditions, and endorsing non-binding principles. Actual behavior is likely to be largely decoupled from these commitments. Accordingly, we expect Western powers will generally be no more likely to transfer weapons to third world countries with good human rights and democratic ideals as bad ones, nor discriminate in terms of the volume of sales. End quote. And this is exactly what has happened, right, David? On the one hand, Germany has considered it within its own self-interest to respect what has become international outrage over the Yemen crisis. However, the UK, which has a much larger economic stake to hold on to, has publicized symbolic outrage over Saudi Arabia's actions while simultaneously doing everything in its power to keep the flow of weapons to them. Well, that makes me wonder, Daniel. So if it turns out that we don't even care whether or not we're selling to human rights abusers or violent dictators, and if we're not going to respect these international treaties created to try and prevent the sale of weapons to terrorists, well, then this must all be because we're getting some serious economic return from all of this. Cha-ching, baby. Right? I would hope so. Yeah. And so, well, I mean, that got me thinking. It's only fair for us to ask the question, do our economies even benefit from all this international arms deals? 
So we started digging and we, we found a handful of analyses that were carried out to determine if spending on defense actually does benefit the economy. And I mean, on a naive way, you would say, well, of course, it's creating jobs, it's selling stuff, there's money coming in that wouldn't have otherwise. So there's definitely a benefit to the economy, right? Well, one paper published in 2001 by a Center for Defense Economics at the University of York in England is entitled The Economic Costs and Benefits of UK Defense Exports. And they predict what would occur in the economy over just two years if UK defense exports were decreased by 50% based on data from the late 90s, during which time defense exports fell 30% and defense employment fell 35%. They claim that, number one, in terms of jobs, a 50% decrease in defense exports would result in the loss of 49,000 jobs in the defense sector. But an additional 67,000 new jobs would be created over five years outside of the defense sector. And number two, the economy as a whole would experience an immediate cumulative adjustment cost of between two and two and a half billion British pounds as the shareholders of these defense industries write off their investments. The government pays short-term unemployment benefits and other costs such as the loss of tax revenue from the defense sector, but those costs are balanced. As they conclude, quote, the significance of a results for the wider debate about defense exports is twofold. Firstly, they suggest that the economic costs of reducing defense exports are relatively small and largely just a one-off thing. That's what we were talking about a second ago with those very quick write-offs of their investments. And back to the quote. Secondly, as a consequence, they suggest that the balance of argument about defense exports should depend mainly on non-economic considerations. And that's the key takeaway that we want to look at from this paper, that the economic impact of these defense contracts are relatively minor because most of the people employed who are generating money in this industry would very quickly find work elsewhere. There's a limited number of qualified scientists and engineers who are available for the economy at whole. And the fact that some are held up in the defense industry means that we are paying a large opportunity cost while they create weapons uh, that could be put into other sectors of research and, and investment. There was another paper from 2003 that also examined the role arms exports play on the UK economy titled The Impact of a Responsible Arms Control Policy on the UK Economy, about what you would expect. And the authors look specifically at what would occur economically if the UK actually lived up to their ideals of ethical and responsible arms trading, that is, avoiding exports to areas with ongoing human rights abuse and conflict. And from the paper, the authors point out, quote, the UK government is committed to an ethical, responsible arms trade policy that in practice has failed to live up to expectations. End quote. At the time of all the UK's export licenses for arms, 58% of them enabled sales to highly sensitive or intermediate sensitive regions involving human rights abuses. All in all, the authors conclude similarly to the previous paper we cite that halting those exports would have little to no negative consequences for the UK economy. So David, basically to summarize, if we were to dramatically decrease the weapons exports that we pay for, not only would we get a net benefit in terms of jobs, but we would free up that money for other areas. And it turns out that that would allow us to live up to our ideals of like not selling weapons to human rights abusers, right? And I just want to point out that's actually a huge number. You said 58% of all UK exports go... <laughs> to regions that are, are highly sensitive to human rights abuse. Mm -hmm. That seems like a, a large chunk of exports that shouldn't be occurring like in the first place. It also conveniently lines up with that figure from the first paper, uh, more or less suggesting that, in fact, if you stopped exporting this amount of, of arms to these countries, well, yeah, you'd have like a year or two adjustment period while these, these defense industry companies would lose a lot of money in their stock market. But after that, the economy would recover and, in fact, be better off than when you started. But that doesn't behoove the shareholders, many of which, as we've mentioned throughout this show, are high-ranking members of the government. It also stands out to me, David, that in terms of these papers, when we consider economic costs of the defense industry, the economic considerations are kind of limited, right? It's, it's really just confined to jobs and like tax revenue and, I guess, investment. Which perhaps would be fine if you're thinking of, you know, like a software company or like a typical white collar industry of, of just supplying a product. But it kind of ignores the fact that these products end up destroying things. And that has to have a cost too, right? Yeah. Uh, this is one of these unforeseen externalities that we talk about a lot on the show where 
you know, typically we're saying this in environmental context where most industries, if not all, are unprofitable when you account for the unaccounted environmental externalities. That is the damage these industries cause on the earth. So if I am flying an airline and I'm polluting the earth and I'm causing all sorts of climate change damage from that, if you counted for that math, which is difficult to impossible to be fair, then no airline industry is even remotely profitable. And this is true of almost every single industry that we as humans have created. And uh, we've extended this idea a little bit in the past to not just limit itself to the idea of environmental destruction and externalities there, but also to human destruction, to the suffering and, and ultimately the quality of life and actual life itself of so many people that these various industries extract. So in the fashion industry, we've talked about the slavery that it's so dependent upon in order to stay profitable. But the arms industry is maybe the most egregious uh, violator of this idea because their weapons that they manufacture are explicitly used to kill people. And even if a bomb is fortunate enough to never be detonated, it has an environmental externality cost. There's a lot of materials in there that were mined from the earth that were combined. That's bad. Uh, the bomb itself, if it's ultimately dropped and it doesn't kill anybody, it's going to pollute that area and damage that for future generations of not just humans, but also all life on this earth. If it is ultimately taken somewhere and disposed of safely, quote unquote, that oftentimes leads to huge amounts of local pollution that impact the local individuals who live there as well as the wildlife of that area. When we take these disparate elements of the earth and we combine them into tools that are used to kill, they are ultimately going to do just that, whether it's in an act of war in an act of defense, or just in the routine disposal of these products from the arsenals in which they ultimately find themselves. This industry as a whole is built upon the idea that it profits from suffering. That is what the arms industry is. It is an industry designed to make money out of human suffering, to convert that into dollars and shareholder value. And the fact that we celebrate this in articles and publications like Bloomberg announcing $2 billion of arms sales to Taiwan is a great thing that we should be investing in the companies that, that have their hands in this sale is ridiculous. These are tools of war. And so we've we packaged them up and sold them as things that, that we need to defend each other. But as we'll talk about in a little bit, oftentimes the very act that these exist in the first place make us more insecure than we would have been without that. But ultimately, every single person who is part of this supply chain, to go back to the very concept that we began this episode with, the long chain of small acts, from removing things from the ground, from the education that someone receives, to combining all of these different things into weapons designed to kill, to maim, to disable, to destroy, is profiting off this ultimate externality of human suffering. And this should not be acceptable. Everyone involved in this chain should realize that they are part of the process of creating evil on this earth. And we, as a culture, as a world, should shame this, not celebrate it, not move these people from these companies of death and put them into high-ranking positions in our government, able to decide what actions these governments are taking for the future of everybody who lives in these nations. Right now, they're trying to push us into war with Iran, a war that most Americans don't want, a war that Iran doesn't want. Calling Iran the aggressors when the U.S. has spent decades trying to goad this country into a conflict. When the U.S. at one point shot down an airliner over Iranian airspace, filled with Iranian citizens, operated by an Iranian company, and then gave the captain of the ship that shot this plane down, that killed everybody on board, a medal for distinguished service. I'll never apologize for the United States of America. Ever. I don't care what the facts are. I will lead her. I will do my level best to stand up for freedom and democracy around the world by keeping the United States of America strong and by keeping our eyes wide open as we welcome change in the world, but keeping our eyes wide open. And so that's the kind of bad guys we are, Dan. We mentioned earlier looking up, waking up one day and looking in the mirror and realizing, are we the bad guys? Yes, we are. And although some of us are more bad than others, the people who are actually selling these things, the people who are actually declaring these wars, the people who are conspiring to figure out how can I push conflict forward so I can profit, so that I can push forward my political career, people like Donald Trump, people like Michael Bolton, people like the senators and the representatives who attempt to get these military contracts put in their own districts in order to provide jobs for these people who live in their districts. They're guilty just as much as everybody who ultimately pulls the trigger in the end. We're all complicit in this chain of evil and suffering, 
And the fact that all of this happens without any accountability, without any sort of thought of the suffering that every single person in this process is enabling is disgusting. And this this is the kind of thing that makes me wish there is some sort of divine justice, that there's a karma, that there's an afterlife, that somebody somewhere can finally take into account all these externalities that we can't take into account in the way that we've constructed our economy and the justice of our world. And, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, unfortunately. So we're going to have to do that ourselves. I don't know exactly what that means, but I encourage you to consider this idea and to think about it and to put something into action. I don't know what. I don't know if it's a phone call. I don't know if it's a scorn. I don't know if it's spinning in the food of somebody who is enabling this process to happen. But these types of actions are important to fight the banality of evil. These, These little steps that add up to these great acts of death can also be stopped by little acts that slow down these little bits of evil. And I'm firmly convinced that that's the case. There's no doubt, David, that evil is involved in this process. There's no doubt about that. But if I can offer perhaps a corollary perspective to this, you said something about the way we design our economies. And I think this is really at the heart of this problem. Um, We've somehow gotten away from the idea. I don't know. Maybe in America, we never had this idea, but there's this popular conception that everything should be run like a business. And businesses know how to do things most efficiently. And that's how we should run our government agencies. That's how we should run the post office. That's how we should run healthcare. But when, when it comes down to it, I don't know how this idea got so much traction because businesses exist to make money. And we have to admit at this point that there are a lot of things that should not be profitable. There are certain things about civilization that is a pure cost. And there's no way around that. We talked on this show about the American healthcare system. And the reason why the American healthcare system is so bad is because it is treated like a business. Healthcare is not something that you can profit off of unless someone is suffering. And so we have in America right now, healthcare providers, health insurance companies, and other companies that make up this uh, marketplace for healthcare who are profiting hugely, who are making a ton of money. And on the flip side of that is medical bankruptcy is the number one cause of bankruptcy in America, and people are dying left and right because they can't even afford their own medicine. This is, healthcare is not something that should make money, ever. And I think the, it, we've made the mistake of thinking that security is also one of these things that we can make money off of. Security, like healthcare, should be a cost. It's something that we incur. It's not, if we're profiting off of security, how is that any different from uh, Basil Zaharev's first job as an arsonist for the fire department? Should the fire department also be able to make a profitable return on investment for putting out fires? I don't think so. And we, had, we don't set that up in our economies anymore because we recognized, oh, there's a conflict of interest there. If you pay fire departments based on how much uh, fire they put out, guess what? They're going to start fires. And in America, it's against the law for police to set quotas and try to uh, increase their budgets based on the number of tickets they get, even though they still do this. It's very common. But imagine if we just told every police department, hey, uh, you need to increase the revenue you make from prosecuting criminals by uh, 8% every year. You think that would solve crime? No, it would increase crime because the police departments would then profit off of creating criminals or at least criminalizing people who have done nothing wrong. And we have created a global international arms uh, marketplace that does the exact same thing. The very fact that you can buy shares in a weapons manufacturing company makes no sense because you're demanding that that company to make more money than we have entrusted it with, which requires this profit accumulation that is only possible when violence occurs. How can you demand a bomb making company to return profit to you if there's nothing to bomb? And so, uh, yes, there's a lot of evil here. And every company that is involved in the supply chain is complicit in this evil. And every lobbyist who tries to convince a political leader to deregulate this industry is part of this evil. But we as, as, as citizens have to recognize that our money, our tax dollars, our tax euros, our tax British pounds are being siphoned off to be accumulating these companies that only exist to profit off of something that should never be profitable in the first place. And if we can recognize that and at least hold people accountable to this idea that running security, running defense, running war as a business is not a good idea, 
Just as those world leaders recognized right after World War I, in which we quickly forgot, then at least we'll be moving a little bit towards a better direction. But there's one more question, I think, that's in this larger economic uh, talk about the arms industry, which is, you know, if, if we could have more jobs and there is no economic cost to decreasing these arms exports to countries and regions with human rights abuses, why does it continue to happen? And the obvious answer is because people are getting rich off of this. Uh, whether that's the people who run companies like Lockheed Martin uh, and the way that money trickles down to the government and military elite who have established themselves within those webs of power, or people like Basil Zaharoff, who we've talked about, who profit off the violence itself. And Basil Zaharoff was a so-called merchant of death. And what's important about these merchants of death uh, stories is that they profit in more ways than one. Yes, they contribute to the buildup of arms between major world powers by stoking fear and aggression between them and then profiting off the arms race that takes place between them. That process typically involves legitimate companies and quasi-legal deals. But it is very important to recognize that once these weapons have been stockpiled, once the arms race it has taken place and continues to take place, the door is now open for an inevitable black market to emerge in which new merchants of death can come in and leverage these stockpiles to stoke conflict in smaller developing nations all over the world. Two infamous examples being Victor Boot and Leonid Menin, who each profited handsomely off the caches of weapons that were stockpiled during the Cold War arms race. A Victor was a Russian-born entrepreneur who got his start in the arms business by taking advantage of military cargo planes that were abandoned on airfields throughout the former Soviet empire, uh, which he used as a front for an air freight service while in reality smuggling weapons to war-torn countries around the world. He ignored international embargoes to deliver weapons in Western Africa. He sold weapons to both sides of the Angola civil war and he, he oversaw a complex supply chain that linked stockpiles of military weapons in Eastern Europe to conflicts in Africa and South America. The other merchant of death, Leonid Menin, this was a, another larger-than-life character similar to Basil Saharov. He was actually discovered, David, on accident in the year 2000 when Italian police entered his penthouse suite in Milan to find, to their surprise, half a million dollars worth of diamonds, four prostitutes, a whole bunch of cocaine, and detailed paperwork outlining Menon's sales of millions of dollars of weapons that he made to Liberia in exchange for diamonds and lumber. And this is important because for much of the 1990s, Liberia had been in one of the most brutal civil wars the African continent has experienced. And and less than one month before a very infamous massacre that occurred in Freetown on January 6, 1999, uh, Leonid Menon had personally delivered weapons to the violent forces that killed 6,000 innocent people, maimed many thousand more, and drove 100,000 people from their homes. But this conflict made this man a lot of money, right? And, and so that's just two men, two merchants of death responsible for so much violence. And there must be countless many more who will never make it into the history books, but there is evidence of their work. For example, uh, during the Cold War, Ukraine was a major source of weapons manufacturing for the USSR up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And according to a Ukrainian government-backed report that was uh, subsequently silenced, between the years 1992 and 1998, $32 billion worth of weapons and other military equipment were stolen or disappeared, no doubt to be used in the type of deals that Victor and Leonid made to fuel civil war somewhere around the world so that they could profit handsomely. And so I guess my point in bringing up these characters, David, is just to point out that the arms races that we as, as big superpower countries engage in, the stockpiling of these massive weapon caches uh, to compete with our rivals, those arms races are what enables the, the smaller dealers, the independent rogue companies to then siphon off those products, create their own little micro wars somewhere around the world and fuel violent civil war, violent conflict and profit off of the, the killing of so many innocent people. We cannot sit here and say that we have treaties in place that prevent this. As long as we're going to be stockpiling weapons, 
those weapons will be used for violence. Well, we're seeing some of that violence play out right now, Daniel. I mean, you're talking about things that happened in the 90s and the 80s in terms of civil war going on in, in Africa. But literally right now, as we speak, the conflict that's happening in Sudan is enabled in large part by these private companies who are still supplying these, these countries with arms. In many cases, as proxy companies operating on behalf of the governments who can't directly provide arms to Sudan because of UN embargoes on it. But China, Russia, the United States, all their weapons and manufacturing exports are ending up in Sudan right now uh, to actively oppress uh, civilians. There's a giant conflict going on right now. Uh, people are being tortured, silenced. It, it's awful. And this is enabled by people who are selling these arms to this nation that gives them the opportunity and ability to actively suppress people with this violence. But it's not just, you, you know, the, these these strange uh, named men and every single one of these arms dealers that we've talked about today has a very exotic name, Daniel. And I think maybe if you or I wanted to become an arms dealer, we'd have to change our name first. Apparently you have to have like, it'd be like, uh, there should be like an app, like find your arms dealer name. So I guess it goes back to this like mythification that we have of arms dealers in popular culture. But there are a lot of benign corporations that we, we don't think about as uh, complicit in this arms process that are major military and defense contractors. And and I, I even hate using the word defense contractors here because it assumes that the United States is, is only producing this stuff for defense, which time and time and time and time again has been shown to be nothing but the opposite. Um, but this is like uh, Microsoft, HP, IBM, these tech companies that we, we think about as, oh, they make operating systems, they make stuff. Well, they're also giant military contractors, Verizon, iRobot, the people who make your Roomba, they are a huge military contractor. In fact, one of the top 100 military contractors in the United States. Uh, companies that we like to look up to is like, oh, this is a great company doing good things. Companies like SpaceX, who are putting spy satellites, military satellites into orbit in order to better help the United States kill people all around the world. These people are complicit in this process. Fuck you, Elon Musk. Fuck you, Bill Gates. You are part of the process of making the world a worse place, despite whatever philanthropy you claim that you're doing with your Gates Foundation. These people are happy to profit off the suffering that I keep talking about when it's something that's hidden out of sight, when they can, can distance themselves from the death that's happening because of their position farther down on this chain of evil that eventually builds up to an actual act of death or, or maiming or, or whatever type of suffering, torturing that happens on the other end. And the fact that they just get a pass is ridiculous. And it's not only corporations either. A huge part of this are the labs that are in universities around the United States. Uh, universities like MIT, Georgia Tech, places where they are actively being funded by the U.S. military, by the Department of Defense, by organizations like DARPA, in order to create new technologies to better help the military kill people around the world and ultimately patent these technologies on behalf of the universities to license to arms manufacturing companies like Raytheon, like United Technologies, like Boeing, uh, to then export ultimately at some point, decades down the line, to these developing countries and create conflict and war there. It's a chain of violence that starts even in places that, were, that are supposed to be about ethics, about knowledge, about making the world a better place, they are some of the core centers of the creation of these acts of evil down the line. But they get a pass. All these things get a pass for some reason, and we can't keep letting this happen. We need to emphasize over and over again that you participating in this process is ultimately just another part of somebody pulling the trigger or pressing the button that fires the missile or gives the violence necessary to a dictator or to a despot somewhere. That enables them to cause a genocide, that enables them to torture without any fear of actual resistance or reprisal. David, we mentioned how merchants of death and just the international community of arms dealers generally benefit from pitting countries against each other. And at no time was this happening more aggressively than during the Cold War. And I want to revisit this tidbit of history briefly because I think it's important. The United States was in an arms race with the Soviet Union, you know, capitalism versus state communism. And once the Soviet Union collapsed, you'd think that the great arms race would have ended, right? Well, think again, Dave, because... <laughs> Don't put words in my mouth, Daniel. <laughs> so, because after the end of the Cold War, this arms race didn't stop. And I think this reveals something very strange, which is 
we are in effect in an arms race with ourselves. And I, I'm saying we as the Americans. And this is a really counterintuitive idea, right? How can you be in an arms race with your own self? But I want to start by visiting George Bush's March 1990 White House report titled National Security Strategy of the United States. This is George H. W. Bush, of course. From a section dealing with the Middle East and South Asia, the report says, quote, the free world's reliance on energy supplies from this pivotal region and our strong ties with many of the region's countries continue to constitute important interests of the United States. The Middle East is a vivid example, however, of a region in which even as East-West tensions diminish, American strategic concerns remain. Threats to our interests, including the free flow of oil, come from a variety of sources. End quote. And now I want to jump to a section that deals with Africa, where the president writes, quote, Institution building, economic development, and regional peace are the goals of our policy in Africa. Africa is a major contributor to the world supply of raw materials and minerals and a region of enormous human potential. In the economic dimension, the United States will continue to advocate reforms that eliminate wasteful and unproductive state-owned enterprises and that liberate the productive private sector and individual initiative, end quote. Or to put it in other words, as Christopher Lane and Benjamin Schwartz write in a 1993 article for foreign policy titled American Hegemony Without an Enemy, quote, Damn, that's fire. Without an enemy? Yeah, American Hegemony Without an Enemy. That's fucking fire. I'd listen to that. <laughs> quote, The USSR's demise has also forced the American foreign policy elite to be more candid in articulating the assumptions of American strategy. Underpinning U.S. world order strategy is the belief that America must maintain what is in essence a military protectorate in economically critical regions to ensure that America's vital trade and financial relations will not be disrupted by political upheaval, end quote. So, much of our military presence around the world serves the function of keeping the free flow of materials and goods constant while preventing political systems in those regions from interfering with those flows, uh, which is why George Bush emphasized in 1990 the need to, quote unquote, liberate African resources from state owned institutions, right, so that there can be no political barriers to our taking of those resources. The last thing you want if you're the American empire. Uh, dependent on some material flow of lumber or other goods from some small African nation is for that African nation to decide democratically that, oh, you know, we the people wish to own our own forest uh, or we the people wish to own our mines. We don't want some foreign country to take the minerals that are beneath our feet. That's the last thing we want. So basically what the White House is saying is that we require a large military presence in these regions to ensure that that does not happen. And of course, that requires constant defense exports, which is why around this time, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the U.S. became the world's largest exporter of arms to developing countries. Here's from a 1992 Associated Press article, quote, since 1989, U.S. arms exports to developing countries have increased by 138%. In 1990, increased U.S. exports and the disintegration of the Soviet Union combined to make the United States the world's largest exporter of weapons to the developing world for the first time since 1984. End quote. And so, remember, during the Cold War, the argument was that we needed to stockpile weapons and export them around the world so that we could protect ourselves from the growing influence of the Soviet Union the Red Scare, right? And, and the idea was we need to export weapons to these countries that are at risk of being influenced by uh, Russian propaganda. Um, so we need to empower them with military might. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when uh, America was placed dominantly at the head of, of world power, we continued to export weapons around the world and at an increasing pace. And the question is why? Because as George Bush outlines in that report, the Kremlin no longer posed any threats to our economic interests in the Middle East and Africa. So why are we arming them? Who are we arming them against? 
Well, here's from George Bush's report once again. Quote, the growing technological sophistication of third world conflicts will place serious demand on our forces. They must be able to respond quickly and appropriately as the application of even small amounts of power early in a crisis usually pays significant dividends. End quote. So <laughs> he's writing that there is a growing threat in the third world, which is that they are experiencing an increasing military sophistication. But why is that the case? Who is, who is supplying them that military technology? Who is giving them the, the weapons that is a threat to our power? Well, who's the number one exporter of weapons to the third world or the developing countries? It's us. We are. We have been, in effect, in an arms race with ourselves. And here is a, I want to quote from Chomsky explaining this process in plain language in, in talks he gave in the mid 90s. Quote For the preceding 50 years, our problems have always been laid at the Kremlin's door. But now that the Kremlin's gone, we had might as well tell the truth about it because we still need the same policies. And in fact, just to make sure that there always is a real danger, we also have to sell all these third world powers high tech weaponry. The U.S. in fact very quickly became the biggest arms dealer to the third world after the Cold War ended. And the arms contractors of course know it. Like, if you read Lockheed Martin corporate propaganda, they say, look, we've got to build the F-22 because we're selling advanced upgraded F-16s to these third world regimes. And we're selling them all kinds of complicated air defense systems. And who knows? They're just a bunch of dictators. Maybe they'll turn against us. So we've got to build the F-22 to defend ourselves from all the high-tech weapons we're selling them, end quote. And how is this any different from Basil Zaharoff selling submarines to both sides of a conflict in the late 1800s? The type of wheeling and dealing that escalated tensions that led to the Great War that killed over 16 million people. I really love that that Chomsky quote there, Daniel, and specifically the idea that we keep selling advanced weaponry to these uh, developing countries, to these despotic governments that we said that we're not going to sell them to in the first place. But, you know, uh, money is money. And so we sell it to them and then we say, oh, you know what? We've sold these advanced products that could be dangerous to our soldiers should this despotic uh, whatever turn against us. We need to invest in our own military in order to make us so secure against these things that we've already sold to other people that we need more money, please. And well, then we developed F-22, then we developed the F-35, then we start developing the sixth generation stealth fighter right now, even though it won't be ready for three or four decades. That kind of circular reasoning really defines the arms industry and something that is not new, like you mentioned earlier, as we discussed with the lead up to World War I and Basel Saharov, where yeah, I'm going to sell one enemy, this submarine. I'm going to sell their mortal enemy two submarines. Now I'm going to go back and say, hey, you know, the Atom Empire has two submarines. Couldn't you use one of your own? Couldn't you use maybe another one, maybe a three? How about an anti-submarine missile? You could do that. And then back and forth, and you keep escalating things up. And, and we're doing that in our own military, selling things to developing nations, to nations that could be considered threats, and then spinning it around and, and coming back to us. And Ultimately, sometimes this can also just spiral out of control where we think we have more control over a nation than we do, and we end up uh, threatening the stability of large geopolitical regions. And there's an example of that right now that I want to talk about just briefly, and that's what's happening in Turkey, to go back sort of Daniel to our Ottoman Empire thing. I, like I said, these stories are very uh, cyclical. Mm -hmm. And so in Turkey right now, Turkey, who is a NATO member, um, who has uh, numerous civil rights violations, um, that is actively committing what may or may not be a genocide um, in northern Syria and the Rojava region, specifically in the Afrin province, where they've been uh, funding uh, jihadist death squads that have been displacing and murdering people who aren't of the same ethnicity or religion as uh, the soldiers or mercenaries. Uh, previously, they'd been directly buying oil from ISIS, uh, making sure that they were sending uh, weapons and funds to ISIS. 
it's an open secret in this region of the world that Turkey is trying to to fund this. The whole the whole region's a mess. I don't want to I don't want to get this into a Syrian civil war conversation because it's complicated, it's long, it, it makes a lot of people angry, and uh, there's no point to it. So to go back to modern day Turkey. Turkey is considered a strategic partner in the F-35 development program, which means they have full uh, knowledge share and they also create some of the pieces that are considered essential to the manufacturing and ultimately completion of the F-35 aircraft and project. But Turkey sits in an interesting place, um, sort of in between Western Europe and Russia. And Russia has been trying to court Turkey for a while, the same way the United States has been trying to court. Turkey, because Turkey is such a interesting geographical regional power, uh, the way that they sort of span these areas, that they block certain bodies of water. Um, they're important to the United States Missile Shield Program for NATO, for Eastern Europe, um, and, f- and for their larger ballistic missile shield program around the world. Um, but consequently, also Russia would love to court Turkey for their own purposes, geopolitically, as well as a- another source for selling their arms. So the U.S. has been cooperating with Turkey for this F-35 program. But recently, Turkey put out a procurement order saying we would like to buy some anti-air defense missiles that also have the capability of downing other missiles and uh, ballistic missiles as well. There's really only two major systems in in the world right now that that can fulfill this need. There's an American system called THAAD. Um, The latest one is is pretty up to date. It's, It's pretty, honestly, it's a great system. But Russia has another system of their own called the S-400, which is probably technologically superior to the American system and much, much, much cheaper. You can buy about six units of this Russian system for each one of the American system. It, it's a no-brainer. On paper, everybody wants these S-400 missile programs. Uh, nobody wants the American THADs unless you're forced to buy them because of your treaty obligations. So Turkey put out this procurement and then ultimately decided they were going to go forward by purchasing this Russian missile system instead of the American ones meaning that the American manufacturers of these missiles are missing out on billions of dollars of a potential arms deal. This pissed off the United States, and they are now threatening to take away the F-35 program from Turkey, which of course puts the entire F-35 program at risk and makes certain um, partners in this program more worried about their involvement because Turkey was considered to be such an integral part of it that they could never be kicked out of it like this. But as we've talked about throughout this episode, the U.S. just doesn't care about treaties, obligations, or any sort of contracts when it comes to forwarding their own arms ideals. And and so now we're seeing sort of standoff, and it looks like actually Turkey is going to come out the winner of this. They're going to get this Russian S-400 system shipped in, installed. Their soldiers are going to be trained up on it. They're going to get a much better deal for a superior piece of equipment. And uh, they're still probably going to retain access to the F-35s they've already ordered. So Turkey has already purchased four finished F-35 aircraft, but they have not been delivered yet. And the Pentagon is threatening that if they go forward with this S-400 purchase, that they will not receive those aircraft at all, despite already having paid for them. And they will not be able to afford any more of these going forward. Uh, They've issued this ultimatum and they have till July 31st in order to make their decision. But it really does look like Turkey is going to try and have the best of both worlds and definitely take the S-400 system over the American one. So, I mean, this is like a very interesting, specific example of the way that some of these arms deals can play out when there's competing geopolitical interests between two major arms exporters, the United States and Russia in this case. But the larger thing I think that is interesting here is the idea that the United States and Russia are both willing to destabilize a region that they both have significant geopolitical interests in in order to further their arms exports. And that's this concept that has been continuing over and over and over. And and ultimately, if the United States or Russia ends up losing out on this, it doesn't matter. Um, and they continue to pour arms into other parts of this region. So the United States has been providing Israel with many of its F-35 jets. They've been flying active sortie missions down there. Uh, Russia has been providing Syria with its S-300s, uh, one generation before this current S-400 system, and has S-400s defending their own Russian installations um, within Syria. Uh, Iran plays into all this. It, they're willing to put pump more and more and more weapons into this area that has seen conflict for years at this point, that looks like it's seeing an escalation of conflict with what's going on between the United States and Iran and Israel and Saudi Arabia right now, with the three, um, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S., trying to incite some sort of conflict against Iran. Uh, we're willing to to arm this up even more to add more and more gunpowder to this powder keg already that's just bursting at the seams. And it's all to serve these larger contracts 
that as we've established throughout the show um, in the previous episode, don't really economically benefit these countries when we really get down to the math and do serve to make not only these nations more unsafe, the United States, Russia, whatever, they're all going to come out worse from the ultimate result of this deal either way, but also put at risk the lives of millions of civilians in this region who are now having to suffer under the increased tensions and the fact that there are just that many more weapons out there ready to kill them at a moment's notice. But that's the reality of the way that these arms deals play out. Two ideas I would love to close out with are opportunity cost and national security. In terms of opportunity cost, from Andrew Feinstein's book, The Shadow World, he writes, quote, In addition to the primary moral issue of the destruction caused by their products, there is the related concern of the opportunity cost of the arms business. For while weapons capability is clearly required in our unstable and aggressive world, The scale of defense spending in countries both under threat and peaceable results in the massive diversion of resources from crucial social and development needs, which in itself feeds instability, end quote. And an example he provides is how South Africa was led to purchase some $7.5 billion worth of war equipment, earning several hundreds of millions of dollars in commissions for arms dealers at a time when 6 million South Africans with HIV desperately needed medicine the government could not afford. But think, think back to that $2,100 per capita figure we quoted at the beginning of part one that comes directly out of the pockets of U.S. citizens. Are there domestic issues that we face like crippling debt, medical bankruptcy, infrastructure collapse, and more that might be better served than the spending we do for bombs? And of course, like he mentions, this opportunity cost is a form of instability, right? The, the less able a region or nation is to provide basic services for its people, the more our people are dying because they can't access affordable insulin. They have to ration these things just to get by and end up dying as a result of it. The more these types of things happen, the more instability we will face and the more likely violence becomes. And of course, like we mentioned, the... uh arms buildup itself opens the door for black markets and these merchants of death who encourage and then profit off of perpetual war. But in a more direct way, the proliferation of arms and these deals that our countries do is itself an erosion of national security for the very countries doing this, the selling. And this occurs in quite alarming ways. For example, if you think about uh, perpetual enemies of the United States, There are two names that come immediately to mind, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And these are networks that the U.S. military has opposed for so long. But (laughs) these were formed as a direct result of the weapons that Americans sold to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And this was part of an operation by the CIA codenamed Operation Cyclone. This was the most costly and lengthy secret CIA operation ever undertaken by the U.S. Um, And what this operation was, it was the direct arming and financing of the most militant Islamist groups we could find in Afghanistan, uh, specifically this being the Mujahideen. And this occurred between 1979 and 1989 and towards the later part of this operation. Okay, the United States was giving the Mujahideen $630 million per year in weapons and other financing. Now, why were we doing this? And by the way, we did not stop this after 1989. It just wasn't secret anymore. Uh, But the question is, why were we doing this? All of this was an attempt to uh, get back at Russia or or somehow negatively influence uh, Russia's dominance in the East. And basically what we did is we looked at them and said, how could we get Russia to enter into a military conflict, a quagmire, so to speak, just like we, the Americans, uh, got into in Vietnam that drained our resources? How can we cause Russia to do the same thing, make the same mistake, so that they will have to redirect resources, and this will, in a roundabout way, cause a decline of their influence? I think there's two things we should take away from this story. One, 
we should all be disgusted at the way our governments essentially play games with people's lives. Our governments say, oh, you know, if we arm these militant rebels and fuel them to fight a civil war, it will encourage one of our economic rivals to divert resources, giving us an edge somewhere else. Did anyone in this strategic planning process ever consider that these machinations would result in the countless deaths of innocent people? I think it's particularly telling that we wanted Russia to make the same mistake we made in Vietnam because it's clear our leaders only considered our mistake in terms of its economic and logistical toll. But just consider the human suffering, right? We dropped 7 million tons of bombs and chemical weapons in Vietnam. At least 1 million Vietnamese were killed directly from this, and many, many more have died as a result of either exposure to the chemicals we left behind or from starvation since part of our war strategy was to collapse their agricultural foundation. That's our legacy in Vietnam. And our leaders said, hey, uh, let's get Russia to make the same mistake in Afghanistan. And the second thing we should take away from this is for anyone who's still holding on to the idea that despite all this suffering, our government still acts in a way that is patriotic and in service of its own people. Consider once again that those games they were playing directly undermined our own national security. The Mujahideen were the violent forces that U.S. troops fought so hard to suppress in Iraq in the early 2000s. They were the main aggressor in the Battle of Ramadi in 2006. Those weapons were paid for by U.S. taxpayers, and they ultimately were used to kill American citizens. If we really care about national security, if we really care about human rights abuse around the world, then we would stop this flow of weapons. We would condemn the international arms dealers making billions of dollars off these deals, and we would dismantle this violent, this gross, and this evil system. And we would not even be worse off economically. Sounds like a win-win to me, David. And to me, Daniel. You can find more information about these episodes as well as a full transcript on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, or supporting us on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash ashesashescast. We want to thank our two associate producers, John Fitzgerald, and Chad Peterson. Thank you so much for your support. And also, thank you to all of you who have uh, supported us through Patreon, whether you're a $3 or a $7 or a $1. It really adds up and it really helps. In fact, we were recently able to purchase a new piece of sound equipment, which is going to make recording these episodes so much easier. Not only will it allow us to process and master the sounds in real time, it enables us to do backup recordings, It'll make it easier to schedule interviews. And if I ever stop procrastinating, I'll make a video to demonstrate uh, all this new capability to you all. Uh, but your contributions are adding up and it's directly enabling us to pr uh, give you a better show. At least we hope so. So if you don't support us on Patreon and would like to, visit that page and, and sign up. Get on the bandwagon. You might even get a sticker. We've been saving up the uh, majority of our donations in order to purchase a used destroyer from the U.S. Navy and become uh, pirates. So uh, we're going to try and uh, make this as doable as possible. So if you want to kick in a little bit extra this month, please do. And uh, you can get a cool pirate crew uh, position whenever we finally make that purchase. Yep. And that is first come, first serve. So again... Uh, hop on the bandwagon if you want to be one of the early crew of that endeavor. We have lots of cool ways of contacting us, but one of the coolest is by far our voicemail phone number, which is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. Just give it a call and leave a message, and we'll eventually integrate that into an awesome call-in show. Uh, we're really excited, so call in now, leave us something cool, and uh, we'll comment on it, reply to you, and do something fun with it. I'm excited. 
We are also on all your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast, so be sure to check those out as well and join our awesome Discord. The community is growing every day. We really love everyone on there, so shout out to all of you. You can find a link to that on our website. Just click the community link at the top and then find the invite link to Discord right there. You can also reach us by email at contact at ashesashes.org. Send us your thoughts. We read them and we appreciate them. Next week, we've got another great episode, and we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Quote, For the the preceding 50 years, our our problems have always been laid at the criminal's door, but now that the criminal's gone, we might as well tell the truth about it. End quote. And how is this? (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty good. Thank you.